Hello there, I'm Windermere Real Estate's Chief Economist, Matthew Gardner, and welcome to this week's episode of Mondays with Matthew. Last week, there were only a few significant announcements, but they were important ones. So let's get straight to the numbers. And first up is the Case-Shiller Index. The data released for July, that's right, the data we just got is three months old. Anyway, their numbers were pretty impressive, with a re-acceleration in the index following three straight months of a COVID-19-induced deceleration, with the 20-city index rising by 0.6% on the month and higher by 3.95% year over year. And it's worth noting, this is the best annual gain since December of 2018. And when we look at the cities that make up the index, there were some very impressive numbers with Phoenix, Seattle, and Charlotte showing the highest year-over-year -year gains amongst the 19 cities surveyed. Now, regular followers will remember that we are not getting data for Detroit because of ongoing COVID-19-related reporting issues. We saw month-on-month -month gains in all cities other than New York, where the index dropped by 0.1%. I did some research, and uh, the drop, although a small one, it could well be due to the fact that business bankruptcies rose by 40% between March, when the pandemic kicked in, and September, with over 600 businesses filing for bankruptcy in the city. Looking closer at the data, seven cities are still at levels below their pre-housing bubble peak, but I'm more interested in the change in momentum. And this shows the difference between the change in index values over the past year versus the 12 months before that. And we're seeing a slowing in the pace of growth in Las Vegas and also in Chicago. Now, we also saw this in the June data. And I'm thinking that the slowdown in Vegas is likely due to its exposure to the leisure and hospitality industry. And I can only assume that Chicago prices are still being impacted by the civil unrest that continues in that city. In all, this was a generally pleasing report, but I will be interested to see if the upward momentum that has kicked back in can carry on through the balance of the year. My gut says that it can. Okay, next up is consumer confidence, and the index jumped to 108.8 from 86.3 in August. And this is a massive jump, uh, even if the number is still well below the 132.6 handle that we saw in February before the pandemic hit. But improvement is clearly palpable. The present situation index, which measures how we're feeling about the economy today, rose from 85.8 to 98.5. And this index was at 169.3 back in February, so it still has got a ways to go. And the expectation index, which measures how we expect the economy to be performing in six months' time, that jumped from 86.6 .6 to 104. And that's not far off the 108.1 number that we saw back in February. Uh, we are clearly seeing green shoots appearing, hopefully, in 2021. My takeaway from this report is that consumers are seeing some improved business conditions. They also did express greater optimism about their short-term prospects as well, and that could support increased consumer spending as we move through the rest of this year. All right, next up, we got numbers from the National Association of Realtors, who released their latest data on pending home sales across the US, and the numbers were nothing short of remarkable. The index jumped by a very significant 8.8% between July and August, now standing at its highest level since NAS started the index way back in 2001. Oh, but it's also worthwhile mentioning the index is up by 24.2% from last August. And as you can see here, sales were strongest in the West, which rose by 13.1% in August. They were up by over 8% in the South and in the Midwest, and were over 4% higher in the Northeast part of the country. Now, what surprised me the most is that numbers jumped even in the face of historically low levels of supply. It's clear that belief in the housing market is continuing to bring out buyers and rock bottom mortgage rates. Well, they're not hurting either. It's also worthwhile adding that the data tells me that closings last month are likely to have picked back up. We had some not, not so impressive numbers in July. So I'll be very interested to see the September figures when they're released 
on the 22nd of this month. I think they'll be good. Okay, last but by no means least, the September jobs report for the United States. Unfortunately, the numbers were far from impressive, with a gain of just 661,000. And as you can see here, we still have a long way to go to get back to pre-COVID employment levels, even if we have recovered 11.4 million of the over 22 million jobs that were lost. But I was pleased to see the July and August totals both revised higher, with the July number bumped by 27,000 to 1.76 million, and the already strong August gains are 118,000 higher than were reported the prior month. In September, we saw solid improvement in the leisure and hospitality and also in the retail sector. Now that's unsurprising as these were by far the hardest hit when the pandemic struck. But government employment was the biggest drag in the numbers, dropping by 216,000. And I looked closer at the figures and this was due to a drop in local and state government education, as many schools maintained at-home instruction as well as 34,000 census jobs that were cut. The unemployment rate came in at a rather quite impressive 7.9%, a decent number. But you see, I poured through the data and I was disappointed to see a 0.3% drop in the labor force participation rate. Now, what does that mean? That means that over 700,000 people left the workforce and this helped the overall rate drop by more than anyone had expected. But on a positive note, the U6 report, which is a far more complete measure of unemployment because it counts discouraged workers. And these are people that they want a job, but they haven't been able to look for one for various other reasons. And it also includes people who are working part time, but want a full time job. And we saw a notable decline. And the numbers here fell from 14.2% all the way down to 12.8%. So the report certainly could have been better, but it could also have been worse. But what the numbers tell me is that another economic stimulus package is absolutely needed in order to prevent further economic slowing. However, I think it's rather uncertain that Congress can get it done before the election. That said, given the fact that the president has now been diagnosed with COVID-19, well, there might be a, a greater understanding that the virus is vicious and it isn't just going to pack up and go away. And its effects on the US economy are still very visible. So there you have it, my thoughts on last week's data releases. The housing reports were solid, and they show that housing remains without a doubt a shining light in the economy, and an economy that's still mired by the COVID-19 pandemic. Now I've taken a look at next week's announcements, and I'm afraid that there really isn't anything coming up that's exciting me. So I've gone back through the suggestions you have sent to me and I've decided to take another look at mortgage rates. I plan on sharing with you where I see them heading for the rest of the year and also give you my updated forecast for 2021. I will tell you this, numbers are looking good, but I do have some very significant concerns that need examining. So with that little teaser, I'll leave you and hope that you'll find time to join me again next Monday and I'll give you my take on the mortgage market. As always, if you've got any questions about this week's data, or if you've got a, a broad topic you'd like me to tackle, I'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, take care out there, and I look forward to seeing you all again next week. Bye now.